neuro-based principles for your marketing strategy with Becky Sims from Reflect Digital today. I have to say this is an area that has really, really fascinated me, um, how the the neuro-based uh, processes in the brain reflect to marketing. So I'm hoping you guys are as excited as I will, as I am. A little bit of uh, uh, protocol here. Um, what we'll be doing is we're going to be taking questions and answers uh, at the end of the session, but I would be delighted if you would like to engage with everybody on the chat facility. So if you could kindly put in there who you are and your contacting your contact details and especially for our, our new members that have joined us here today so that we can share you with everybody else. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Becky. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you so much, Kaz. Right, let's seamlessly get my screen sharing, shall we? Uh, do, 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 do. We're in. You can see my screen. Wonderful. Right. I'll pop it in present mode. Thank you so much for having me today. And yeah, it is a bit of a dreary Tuesday morning. So let's try and uh, brighten it up. And, and I have a lot of info for you all today. So um, take notes, but the good news is the slides are available afterwards and the lovely chamber are filming it. So you can watch it back if you wanna kind of re-go over any of the ideas and you can also reach out and find me on social. So I'll share all of those details at the end. Um, but yes, yeah, so Reflect Digital, I'm the founder of Reflect Digital. We're we're a digital marketing agency based in Maidstone. We specialize in search is probably our biggest area, which is SEO and paid search. So I'm going to use a bit of kind of specific stuff to SEO and paid search today, just to kind of show you how it works there. But I'm going to be talking everything I talk about really works across all areas of marketing. So I'm going to try and keep it broad as well. Um, but you will see some little pockets of um, very specific digital um, applications or reasons it's good. Um, we're a team of 33 now based in Maidstone and growing um, it, we've uh, we've seen a big change over the last year and a lot more businesses are using digital marketing so um, it's been a, a good sector for us to be in um, this last year and that continued growth is uh, is going to be coming into this year so hopefully you'll find this talk interesting and there'll be loads of questions at the end so without further ado um, let me get us started so We'll start by just thinking about the fact that the world does look different today. Alongside the realities of the last 10 months, we've seen transformation and it's been huge transformation. So you think of the fact that we're here today on a webinar doing this, this would have, yes, we used to do webinars, but not to the level that we are now. And the fact that most of us are probably sitting at home as opposed to an office, and um, those are just probably the transformations that have hit us most. But actually in business, there's been huge transformation and moves. We've seen, we've seen real traditional businesses moving to using online advertising that haven't used it before. Um, so it's been a, a big change. And these behaviours, they might have taken years to change, but that process has been sped up and people changed overnight. Um, probably one of the big things that we probably can all agree with is that we're buying more online. Actually, I was always one that was uh, quite against online food shopping and I'm a complete convert now. So I can't remember the last time I properly went to a supermarket for a big shop. So um, we are like the move is happening and people are spending a lot more online. And these stats from the Office for National Statistics just show us up to November and um, what that change had looked like. And and it's it's here to stay like it did tail off a little bit um, over the summer. But I think people have created new habits and and that's probably another talk in itself talking about how we go about creating a new habit but people are spending more time online as well and over this last 10 months we've seen that people have really tried to stand together more so and in doing so it's meant that as a brand authenticity really stands out and that ability to create relationships with your audience so it means that it's more important than ever to not, not just be a faceless company, but to be a company that stands for something and that does build relationships with their audience and is more than just a website and, and you might have physical outlets as well, but you're more than just that. You've got this personality that people can feel something about and you start to then build a community. 
And off the back of that, you start to create content that inspires because it's this idea that to keep your audience engaged, you need to keep creating stuff that, that they want to look at and they're interested in and that grabs their attention and, and keeps that conversation going, even at a point where maybe they're not spending money with you as a business, but so that you're front of mind when they're ready to buy your service or buy your product again. And content is at the heart of every single marketing strategy. And that's really what we're going to talk about today is content. And, and for me, content is everything from a headline on a, on a billboard or on a paid search ad, all the way through to a 5,000 pound, really 5,000 pound, 5,000 word detailed article that sits on your website or sits on a PR website. So content is everything. It's the words that we're using. But we also have to remember that at the heart of your strategy needs to be your audience and that your audience are humans. So just like you and I and everyone on this call, we're all humans and we all feel emotions and we need to remember that and think about how do we appeal to humans in the right way. So my question, I guess, uh, just one to think about and think next time you're creating content as well is how often do you really put a human lens on your marketing and what you're creating? I think it's so easy to get caught up in this churn where we've got to keep creating content that sometimes we forget to take that step back and think as a as a human and with everything else that's going on in the world. What does my what does my piece of content or my advert here? What, what does this look like? So today I'm going to give you some new ways to look at content and to think about content. And the idea is this is to complement your existing strategy. So it's not a case of throwing everything you're doing currently out the window. You're doing great work, I'm sure of it. But this is just new ways that you can think about things and little processes you can put in place. And for those of you that are doing SEO, this really will work in harmony with your SEO strategy. So I'm just going to frame what SEO is in case anyone on the call isn't so familiar. So search engine optimization. So this is the practice of, of getting your website to, to the top of Google, really. Um, and I guess the reason some of this is so important is that SEO in the past has been very much people have felt that they really needed to kind of follow a set formula and write with specific keywords and content could feel quite robotic and less human. And the great news is I'm going to be telling you today that that's less of the case these days. So I want you to meet Bert. We've probably all met Bert before. Good old Sesame Street Bert. Um, he's actually become an SEO icon. How did that happen? How did a Muppet give us the gift of human content? Well, I'm going to tell you. So why, why am I talking about Bert? It seems really random. So this is what Bert stands for. And don't worry, I don't understand this either. So bi-directional encoder representations from transformers. I mean, it's a foreign language, isn't it? But it does make sense. And according to Google, this is the most important update that they've done in the last five years. So this was a big thing. And I'd agree with Google on this. So Google have said, and I won't read this verbatim, but I'll, I'll pull out the key info for you, that the BERT update, so the update that they did to their algorithm, which was the end of 2019, was all around improving language understanding. So it was helping Google to work a bit more like a human in understanding these kind of conversational queries. So we've seen a move over the years where people are less, um, less just typing into the search box on Google. We're picking up our devices. We're talking to our devices. We're being more open in the way that we search for things. But that was becoming quite a difficulty for Google to understand because conversational search isn't always um, as clear for for Google or it wasn't previously. So what the BERT update has done is meant that us as the, as the humans out there using Google can search in a more natural way. So this is awesome news, like it really, really is. It means we can be more human and we need to think less about appealing to Google and more about appealing to our audience. But how does, Go, how does BERT work? So this is a great quote that really sums it up. So you shall know a word by the company it keeps. And this is really true. I'm gonna show you some examples. So this is how words completely change based on context. So I'll use the middle example. So the word date. So her favorite fruit to eat is a date. Joe took Alexandria out on a date. We know immediately 
the difference between that word. But actually to Google, if we roll back before they did this update, that was a challenge because, well, hold on, what, which date, what, what date are we talking about here? And it is confusing. So the words in a sentence help us to understand and we get that immediately. We don't even have to think about it, it just happens. So this is an example before Google did the BERT update um, and after. So this was, this was an example they used um, in the US. So can you get medicine for someone pharmacy might have been what someone typed in. And on the left, you see that previously Google would have suggested a page about getting a prescription filled. But on the right, Google now understands really what the person meant there, which was, can I send like, a family or friend member to get my prescription? And you can just see the difference in the results. And that was literally immediately from this update happening. So this is great because when we're thinking of content for a website and search, we can focus more on the human and the content and less about worrying that we're doing the right stuff for Google. And previously we'd all get maybe wrapped up in the algorithm if you were in the SEO world. And we'd forget that to truly good, be good at content creation, what we're trying to do is spark action from users. So therefore we need to write content that really does speak to the human. So I believe by understanding humans, it's gonna make us all better marketers, whatever field of marketing you're in. So another question for you to think about, how well do you know your audience? So those groups of people that your business is trying to get in contact with and trying to appeal to, and you might have multiple different audiences or you might have a really specific one, but how well do you know them? So we're going to play a game which is just for you to play at home and to have a think about, but it's a who am I describing? So on screen here, I'm going to give you a couple of uh, demographic details about two famous people. And in your heads, just have a think about who I might be describing. So they both live in London. They're both between 30 and 40 in age. They're both millionaires. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> and they're both parents. So these are kind of typical demographics that as marketers we might use. We might bucket off our audience and say, right, we're going for the 30 to 40 year olds. We want parents, that's our message. We want rich parents uh, and we're gonna target London. But actually, as I show you who these people are, you can see how different that can, uh, that can result in. So this was Skepta and Prince William. So by those demographics, they fall into the same bucket. But I can be 99% sure if I asked you all to try and sell your product or service to Skepta and Prince William, you might frame it slightly differently. And you might want to pull on different benefits or there might be different ways that you would want to, to communicate to them because they're very different people and we're all different. So today is about thinking, how can we reinvigorate this editorial flair? And don't worry if you've never had, felt like you had editorial flair, I'm gonna help you get some. By understanding that when it comes to writing online content, that Bert understands and loves human content and that that's what humans are looking for as well. So let's watch some website content in real life. Now, don't worry, I'm not gonna play you too much of this because it's painful, but um, a colleague of mine recorded a video reading some content we found on the internet. This was on a, I think it was a homepage of a website. Um, so hopefully this is gonna play properly. So bear with me. Across our network of showrooms, we stock vehicles from quality car makers, Toyota, Nissan, Volkswagen, Renault, Dacia and Audi. We provide top quality, brand new and approved used cars, along with excellent after-sales services. We have locations in Ashford, Bristol, Bromsgrove, Canterbury, Cardiff, Coulson, Dartford, Gatwick, Rosal, Dartford, Horsham, Mason, Nefai, Newbury, Newport, Oxford, Reading, Southwest, Chaffers, Chaffers, Girls and Worcester. I'll put you out of your misery. Wow, we don't speak like that, do we? I really hope we don't. But for some reason, we can often end up with content like that on our website. And previously, that might have been driven by SEO and people saying that you've got to list all your locations and you've got to list all your brands. But wow, we need to get rid of this content and think of new ways to make sure that information is available, but that we're not boring our audience. So I want you to think differently about content to take a new focus. 
and make sure that's a human focus wherever you're creating this content for. And why? Well, because without this, I believe you're failing your audience. Now, economists realize that people don't always respond predictably or rationally to things like price and value. And there's a ton of books out there. I've got some examples on screen, but if you need more recommendations, just uh, I, can, uh, I can send you my Kindle list of reading. There's tons of books that kind of talk about this. And neuroscientists have discovered that all decisions are weighed up emotionally, even the ones that we believe we've spent ages logically thinking about and that we definitely made the right logical decision, emotion was there. And, and that's so important to remember. And digital marketing has become so measurable, but I guess my concern is that is this focus at the, at the expense of content and at the expense of getting that emotion right and talking to your audience correctly. So I need to add a check to your website content creation process. And, and I specifically say website because we're going to talk about um, some of the things that you would definitely do if it was web content. So this is the kind of process that, and if you're not doing this process, don't worry, but these are some of the steps that you might want to start looking at, including in that process. So define your market. So you've probably, you've done that way before you've started thinking about your content, you know your market. And you're going to define your audience. So hopefully you're clear on that as well and you know who this content is for and what their interests are. Then we've got keyword research. So this specific to, to creating website content, if we're writing something, it's really good to understand how might someone search for it that's relevant to wanting to find this content. So we can go and there's lots of tools out there. Um, probably the, the best tool that I'm using at the moment is called Keyword Surfer. So if you're not doing keyword research, go and have a look for Keyword Surfer. You can add it as a Chrome extension, so and it's completely free. And every time you use Google, it will show you how many searches happen every single month for that phrase that you've included. So you can literally sit there and, and do research to understand where the types of words people are using to search for particular things. So we do that and then we know we can use those words because as much as I said SEO's moved on and, and we don't want to, we want to make it more human, we do still want to make it that if there's a particular way people search for us that we're using those words at least once on the page to make it easy for Google to understand. Then you might map this to, to your sales funnel and this is probably quite advanced but it's something that I would definitely recommend thinking about. So if for example you're creating a piece of content and it's more awareness driven so the uh, the types of phrases people would search for are quite early on in their research phase you're going to want to drive them to a very different page to if it were further on in the sales funnel when they've been super specific so I don't know if I think if I was searching for dresses that's really really broad so I'm looking for inspiration and ideas. But if I've searched for yellow sundress, dreaming of summer here, um, then I've been really specific and you wanna land me on a really specific page with, with what I'm looking for. So we kind of think of it that way. And then this next stage, so this is the new one. This is the one that you, you definitely are unlikely to be doing. Um, and I'm gonna give you an easy way to do this. So uncover audience motivations. And then you carry on and you, you can create your content. So what do I mean by that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a couple of seconds to think about something. And again, if we were in real life, I'd make you shout these things out. So I've, uh, you've been saved from that. Um, so I want you to take 30 seconds and just on a piece of paper next to you, just to jot down what's most important to you about your career. So we're thinking one word answers. So my example might be um, fame for the business. So that's not one word, but it's short enough. Um, security, so giving my team security, but security for me as well. Um, and team happiness, that might be my three. So I'm gonna take a sip of water while you just think for a second about what's important to you. It will become clear why in a minute. It's gonna help you understand this model. So this model that we use is called monkey lion dog 
And this was created by Lab, who are our parent agency. And this is a bit of fun, but it is founded in science. So there is, um, there's a number of different theories. So three needs theory and um, FIRO theory that have gone into creating this. But the idea is it's quite fun and it's easily memorable. So it's called Monkey Lion Dog. At the bottom of the page here, you'll see there's a URL. You can go and take the test if you want to later to see, um, see where you fit. And the idea is, is that we've all got a bit of each of these within us. So we'll all be a bit monkey lion and dog. And it all change depending on setting and scenario. So for example, um, at work, you might be more one way and at home, you might be a bit different and the context might change. So the idea is that the monkey is our kind of, um, the part of our brain that is really wanting us to be recognized and is looking for praise and to have status and recognition and, and really wants to understand our purpose. The lion part of our brain is that real rational part of our brain and it's the weights and measures. It's the, we wanna get our intentions met. We wanna be competent. We want to um, master things. And then the dog is the emotional side of our brain. So this is our, our need to connect with people, with our friends, our family, communities, and, and where we have a real fear of being rejected. And the thing here is all around kind of authenticity. And, and so we'll all be a bit of each of these, but the idea is what we want to think about when we're thinking about our audience is trying to get our heads around where they might be uh, what might be driving them to want to buy our product or service. So on the next few screens, and remember, I'll give you these to download at the end, you can see some more words. So the reason for getting you to write some words down is to start to have a think um, where you might fit in this. So, so for example, my examples were, so fame for the business, so that's monkey, security, that's lion, and team happiness, that's dog. So I might have done that on purpose as an example, but, but you can see, so I therefore had a mix of all of them. I definitely, every time I take the test, I'm very much a monkey. So I'm happy to share that with you um, and no shame in it. But um, when we start to understand that, so for example, I've got an example for you here. Um, one of our clients, uh, L3 Harris, they're a pilot training school. So they uh, typically, when they joined us, their marketing messages were all very kind of feature benefit led around the type of training and the high quality training and things that would fit probably more into lion messaging. And, and that is something we see so often, especially in the business to business world. A lot of messaging ends up being lion. We tend to be kind of features and benefits and that side of things. We miss thinking about emotion and tapping into people. So what we ended up doing for L3 Harris, a couple of um, examples here, and these are just the concepts. So one of their profiles that we came up with was this aspiring aviator who was very much in that monkey camp. And the type of kind of headline was like, it's not for everyone. Like we're trying to make people think this is super exclusive and that's gonna really tie into their drivers. So one of the reasons they wanna be a pilot is they wanna walk through the airport feeling really great as the pilot of, a, of an airplane. And we're trying to bring that through in the messaging. So it's not for everyone or the sky is not the limit. So the idea that, that it is unlimited, their potential and really playing on that. So that's just some examples and it works really well using Monkey Lion Dog to think about advert headlines. So we use it a lot within our paid search team, but it does work in longer form content as well, because what we're trying to do is just get under the skin of our audience. And instead of just um, thinking about our product in the now and the, and the detail and the features and the benefits, instead we're trying to think about um, why does someone want to buy our products and what, what's going on in their life that could help us use that within our messaging to help them understand if it's right for them or not. So how do we make our content more human? We're getting there, we are getting there. There's loads of information flying at you and hopefully it's making sense. Um, and we need to think about what the impact is as well, which if you're looking at this from an SEO point of view, this could be rankings, because we know Google's gonna care more about human content these days. It's gonna resonate, they, they can see that. 
Um, increased conversions, this is probably the important one. If we can get the right messaging on our website, we're going to be so much more likely to convert our audience and to, to stay in their minds and to be memorable. And how can we speak our audience's language? So how can we make sure that when we create content, we're matching them as best as possible so that they, they feel something about us and, and they've got that, um, that joined up feeling of, of we're on the same page and we're on the same journey. So this is another tool that we have within our, um, with our, within our toolbox. So we've been listening and listening to what audiences are saying. And this is using something called comparative linguistic analysis. So this is something that um, if you're interested in, you'd need to come and have a chat to us about how we can do it as opposed to, to one of the tools. And I'm gonna give you some more you can take away from today. But I just thought this was interesting to share because it's super clever. Um, so these are just some stats I'm gonna show you first of all, just to show you the type of comparison we can do. So we've, we were able to compare the trends pre um, COVID and during lockdown one. Seems a long time ago now, doesn't it? So one of the big trends that came out, which probably feels quite obvious, is that, that we had a lot less to look forward to. So in January 2020, so this time last year, people were 4.5 times more likely to say they couldn't wait to get paid. So that was the real feeling that was coming. Um, and this was using Twitter data in particular. So we scraped Twitter and ran it through our tool to pull out these comparisons. So this was leading to this kind of higher demand for immediate gratification because coming into lockdown one, suddenly we, we'd gone from having all these things to look forward to that we were no longer sure that we could look forward to them. Therefore, we had this real need to, how can I get something now? I need something to make me happy now. What can I get delivered to my door? And for many of us, we were sharing our final straw. What do I mean by that? So we were talking in a final type context. So we were using phrases such as I will never, which is quite a serious phrase to use on social media. Um, so people were 6.1 times more likely to be talking about delivery in April compared to March. And this was in the final type context. So I will never use whichever service again, for example because we were all getting really frustrated as the delivery companies uh, got, got used to this influx that they'd had. And the phrase customer service was mentioned 1,252 times more during lockdown one compared to, to pre-COVID. So you can see we were all quite frustrated. Um, but what this tool allows us to do is to understand those trends and then to look at how we use those in our content to, to be speaking in the right way for our audience and using the right language. So we can compare any unstructured language data. So for example, we can compare locations. So we've done this for clients before where maybe they've got a UK and a US audience. And as much as we all use the English language, we use it quite differently. So we're able to pick up the trends and help us make sure our content's really relevant in the right location. Could be demographic focus. So if we've got, um, unstructured language data we can pull, but we know demographics against it, i.e. male or female, or if we can pull out ages, etc., we can compare that. Or like the COVID example, we can do time-based. So we can see over time how patterns and trends change and the types of words that we're using and the feelings and emotions that are coming through. And the purpose of this is to help us drive relevancy and help us get closer to our audience by being able to mirror their language more and mirror their feelings more and have that kind of more authentic uh, messaging coming out from the business. So here we go. We're going to look at the neuro-driven content principles. So this is the four principles I'm going to give you to take away today off the back of this. And we're going to look at four types of language. So we're gonna start with uninspiring language and you'll be amazed how often it's used. And I'm sure most of us are criminal of the video I played earlier, whether you wrote the content or you worked at a company that had that content on your website, it's happened, I'm sure it's happened. But what we need to remember is that our content needs to be sticky. We wanna hold on to the person, like the longer we can engage them, the better. And we wanna be memorable because people shop around, they go to lots of different websites. So how do we make sure our content stands out and is the one that they come back to? 
and we need to evoke emotion. And this ties in so well to memorability because there's a proven link between the two. If we can evoke emotion from someone and make them feel something, they're going to be much more likely to remember it. So that's where um, in our kind of design side of the business, we sometimes talk about friction and the idea of actually a bit of friction on a website, a bit of making people think isn't always bad. I think we, there's, there's books out there, there's one in particular called Don't Make Me Think as, as about usability, but, but sometimes that can go too far the wrong way actually. If we can make them think in the right way and not frustration and anger, ideally we don't want them feeling that way about our brand, but if we can make them think and feel something, then it's a really good thing for memorability. So secondly, we're going to talk about the balance between self-obsessed and selfless language. So you need to think about your content as being outside in versus inside out. So inside out is me on broadcast. That's me. I feel like I am on broadcast, so I apologize. But it's me going, Reflect Digital does this, 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 this. And you're just like, oh, God, stop it. Whereas outside in is me understanding your challenges and using that in my content to create something that hopefully is really useful to you, but you also realize that it's something that we can help you with um, if you need it. So it's that kind of audience first, challenges first, and then it's okay to talk about your brand in there as well. And then thirdly, we're gonna talk about static versus dynamic language. So the idea that static is more in the present and in the detail and in the now, it's that features and benefits. Um, and dynamic language, which is more about impact and the future. And if you buy this product, this is what you're going to feel like in six months time, or this is the impact it'll have had on you. So you may not realize it, but through content, we actually have a lot of power. And this is quite um, like when I learned this, I was, I was blown away a little bit. Um, so let me take you to Florida. Well, actually, travel restrictions, we definitely can't do that. So we'll stay where we are. We'll talk about John Barge from here. So he uh, ran an experiment back in 1996 that has become known as the Florida effect. And what he did was he took two groups of students and he gave all of them pieces of paper. And on those pieces of paper were random words. And he asked them all to go into two separate rooms and they had to arrange those words into sentences. And as soon as they'd done that, they could finish, come out of the room. They then had to walk down a long corridor to his office, sign a piece of paper, and then they were done. Little did they know that in their two groups, group one had just completely random words, but group two also had random words, but dotted into those random words were words that would make you think of older people. So examples on screen, bald, wrinkled, arthritis. Florida is apparently because that's where all the older people in the US go to live, apparently, which uh, as uh, I mean, I'd happily live there and that's fine. But um, but yeah, so they had so they had those dotted in there, but they wouldn't have realized it was they still had random words. So they both groups did the exercise and the scientists were watching what they did. And they both had to walk down the corridor, sign this piece of paper. And what they realized is that group two, because they'd been primed to think about old people, they took on the persona of older people. They walked slower than they had walked into that room. They had a different move about them. Everything had changed. And it's just amazing to see by priming people with words, how you can change their behavior and their physical behavior and completely unknowingly to them. So I guess the message of this is to think about making sure that your content has the words and the feel that you want your audience to go away with. Like if you're trying to write something really upbeat that makes them feel good and makes them feel really confident about making a decision, we need to make sure we've got words in there that make them feel that way because otherwise you're making the job really hard for yourself. So yeah, super, super interesting. And then finally, we've got visual, auditory, and kinesthetic language, so VAK. And what do I mean by this? Well, visual is the, I see what you mean. Auditory is, I hear what you're saying. And kinesthetic is, it feels to me like. So we will all have a bias towards one of these and we'll write with more of those types of words. And so you might not know what your bias is at the moment, but you might, might be able to find it out in a moment. Um, 
but the idea is is because we've all got these biases we want to try and make sure that our content is balanced across all three and that we are using a mixture of visual auditory and kinesthetic so that we really are appealing to our audience so it's just something to be aware of so with all of this what we're trying to do is master content that sparks emotion which will make it memorable and action so that we're giving them the right content to make the decision that we want them to to make so it's like Christmas today, and I know we've only just had Christmas, but you've got it again in January. I've got a gift for you all. Um, and it's a website that we created that's completely free to use called Rate My Content. So ratemycontent.co.uk, what it does is it takes all of those four principles that I just talked about, and it allows you to score your content. So you can go and see how it performs on each of those areas. So we have the barometer, so I do apologize, this does have a boring score. And don't worry, I have received the boring score before, I'm not immune, so, um, so don't feel too bad if that happens. But what this does, so this score particularly is looking at descriptive words, so the verbs that we're using, how, we're, how descriptive we're being in the context of how long our content is, and it's gonna really push you to think about using more descriptive and more colorful language. And the three scores here are, boring so sorry um, fine which is okay uh, and engaging and then we have the static versus dynamic score so this is represented by the tarot cards and you will either get the present which is static so you're kind of talking about the the now and in the detail or you'll get the future which is um the impact and the the kind of more dynamic content then you're gonna have the selfish and selfless score. So this is, uh, he's either gonna keep hold of his candy floss and be really selfish. He's either gonna hand it all over and be really selfless, or he might share it if you're kind of balanced. And then finally, you're gonna have your visual auditory and kinesthetic. So what this will do is at the top, it will show you the amount of words you've got that are visual auditory or kinesthetic. And then the meter is gonna kind of give you a score based on the amount of words you've got, and what that kind of looks like and whether there's room for maybe adding some more. So I've got some examples. We ran two different websites through this so that we could just talk through them today. So I thought, what's nicer than a Porsche 911? Like that's pretty engaging and exciting, isn't it? So hopefully we're gonna see some lovely scores or not. So they got the boring score. So Porsche have somehow made a Porsche boring, which I'm not really sure you wouldn't think it was possible, would you? But you do have to take context into this. So we need to think about it and look at the page and actually there's a lot of specification content that goes onto a car page. Therefore, that isn't going to be very engaging. And that's maybe OK, because that's going to pull your score down. But you do have to think about it. And there are definitely areas for improvement for them on this. We've then got the static score. So this does happen more often on product based content because we are being very descriptive about the features of the product. So it can end up more. Um, in the present as opposed to thinking about the future and what life with a Porsche might be like. Then they got the selfish score. So they're talking too much about themselves. So they haven't been talking about their audience and framing what your life is gonna be like with a Porsche in it and putting the, the user into the driving seat as it were. And then they did really well on visual words, huge amount of visual words and a few kinesthetic, but no auditory words at all, which, I mean, I can hear the Porsche roar. I mean, that's a perfect word that would have worked on, on the page. So again, trying to get that balance. So we've then, we've gone on and we've bought our Porsche. We decided we'd not worry that it was boring. So the next thing, if we're buying a car, we're gonna need some car insurance, which, it's really boring, isn't it? I mean, I've got no interest in, in the exciting content of car insurance, but Compare the Market have done really well. They managed to get an engaging score. So they've managed to make their content read in such a way that it's engaging and they're being descriptive and, and it's not the boring car insurance that we might expect it to be. They got a dynamic score as well. So they were looking more at the future thinking about your life with this car insurance in it and the impact of having car insurance. They got selfless, so they've managed to put their users into the content and make you feel like this is something relevant for you and, and it's not just them on broadcast talking about themselves. 
And then, then we'll let down a tiny bit on the BAK. So a few visual words, a few auditory and no kinesthetic. So there's always going to be room for improvement. But this tool is there for you to, to go and use and, and test some of your content in. I will say, so you can pop a URL in, but if you can, it's better to copy and paste your content in. You're going to get a better uh, specific score because obviously the tool might find it a bit difficult sometimes to find where your content is on the page. So you may end up taking more content in than, than it means to. Um, and what, keep an eye on this tool as well. We had a meeting last week and there's a ton of new features and ideas that will be coming out later this year um, to, to take this to the next level because at the moment it's, it is useful and there's obviously this science behind it, but it is a bit of fun as well. It's kind of giving you a steer. It's not necessarily giving you exactly what you need to do, but, but keep an eye for the future. So um, with the tool, we've been keeping an eye on the results that have been coming through it. So I thought I'd just share some of those. So thinking about B2B, so we've had 650 web pages run through it at the point that, that we took these scores. And the results might shock you. They are a little bit shocking, or maybe not. So 45% of B2B content scored boring. So that's definitely something we can all work on and how to make our content more engaging. Even if we were getting more of a fine score, it might be hard sometimes to get that top end engaging score. Only 13% got an engaging score and 70% was static, which means in, in this B2B content that's been run through it so far, and obviously I know that's pretty broad as B2B, but we're talking more features and benefits. We're not necessarily talking about impact and future. So that's definitely something um, that we want to be doing in our content. 40% was selfish, so being too much about themselves, which again, context depends on the type of pages that were put through, but still we wanna try and make sure we're putting our audience first. And then we had a look at about a hundred entertainment and leisure sites, cause we thought, well, this is gonna be, um, this can be really exciting content, isn't it? No, 52% <laughs> achieved a boring score. So we're talking about entertainment and leisure and things that people can go and do and enjoy. And somehow we're making it boring, which, which definitely is something we need to look at. Uh, and 82% was static. So again, stuck in that kind of detail, which I suppose if it's, if it's a venue, for example, or an event space, and it's kind of more detail of, of what's happening, but there's definitely room to improve that as well. And 48% selfish. So I'm going to start to wrap us up. So we have got time for some questions. So I'm going to give you my top nine tips. So these are things to really think about to make your content more human. So be more fun and descriptive. Play with your language. Just remember that as humans, we find descriptive words a lot more engaging to read. So think about how you can bring your content to life more. Think about bringing emotion to your content. What feelings does your product or service evoke? And is there a way to use it? Because remember, if we can make people feel something, they're going to be more likely to remember it. Be outside in, not inside out. So make sure you're always trying to think about your audience challenges first before just kind of being on broadcast with what it is that you do. Think about context. So don't just explain the features. Think about the impact. What's the impact of buying your service or working with you? Consider how you can use a good variety of visual, auditory and kinesthetic language. So there's some examples on screen there of the types of words. And think about balance. So remember, especially if you're thinking about search and Google, Google understands context more than ever before. So make sure you've got that right balance between human first content and having the signals that we know that Google's gonna need. And then consider how you can get closer to your audience's language. How can you reflect their choice of language and match their trends, be more relevant, more authentic, and really help to build that relationship with your audience? And think about motivations. Remember, what we're always trying to do here is attract the attention of humans. So it, the world is busy now, online is busy. If you're putting ads out, it's busy. So trying to grab their attention is difficult. But if we can think more about their motivations and what motivates them to buy what it is that we're trying to sell or what we're trying to get them to click on, then we can use this to draw them in and grab their attention. And then finally, remember the old people. 
Well, they weren't old, were they? They were young. But remember that power that you have to affect your user's behavior by the words that you choose to use. So be really aware of this. So let me tie it all together. We've learned about humans and how we might want to think about their motivations. We've learned about language and hopefully not in a boring English lesson way. Hopefully we've learned about how we can use comparative linguistics to uncover targeted language and, and demographic led trends. How we need to be more colorful in the language that we use to be sticky, memorable and to evoke emotion. We've learned about how we need to balance ourselves and our audience. And the fact that we need to balance the why and the what of the current situation with the future and the so what. So it's that balance of detail and context. And then finally, we need to be really conscious to use a variety of visual, auditory and kinesthetic language. So on that note, it's been great to virtually see you all today. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you've heard at least one thing that you can go and implement today or tomorrow. And I hope that I've been able to shift your view on content and that I've made an impact on how you think and how you interact with others. Thank you so much. You can download the slides at our website forward slash KICC and you can rate your content at ratemycontent.co.uk and you can find me on Twitter or LinkedIn or, or wherever. So yeah, thank you so much. Hopefully you found it interesting. I'll stop sharing now so we can do questions. Thank you very much indeed. That was very interesting, very thought provoking. We're very fortunate today to, to be able to have two word linguistics specialists with us today with Christina Bowden and, and Sarah Hawes. But without further ado, I've got a couple of questions. The first one is from Pete. Pete, can I kindly ask you to unmute, sir, and pose your question uh, to our speaker? Yeah, first of all, thank you for a great presentation. Um, I just wondered with regards to the tool that you can run the content through, is there something like that for social media sites, um, Instagram, Facebook, or is it just for websites? So there's not at the moment, but you can literally copy and paste your content into there. So if you were creating your content for um, social media, you could take just those small little chunks of text that you're going to use and run it through there. But that is, do you know what, that might go onto my uh, onto my list for development plan, whether we can, because it's obviously it's harder when it's a smaller amount of content to get some of those bits in and to get a feel for them. But that is, oh, you've given me something to think about there, Pete. I like it. <laughs> okay, thanks. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Pete. Uh, I believe you're new to, to the networking and, and you're a professional Toastmaster. Sorry, uh, if you could unmute. No, Toastmaster? No, I'm from Kingsdorf Parish Council and I also have, uh, I'm a self-employed sports coach and event manager. Oh, sorry. Yeah, got you confused with another guy here. I obviously okay. need more coffee this morning. <laughs> we have thank another. You very much. Thank you so much for your contribution. We have another question from Anushka, a Value Chamber member. Anushka, can I kindly ask you to unmute and put your question to Becky, if I may? Uh, yeah. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi, Becky. Thanks for your presentation. Hi. Um, I was just wondering on the VAC visual auditory and um, kinesthetic learning styles, why um, the reading writing, the R, um, if you had that been deliberately taken out? Um, I think the way we've looked at it, so this came from our behavioural science team, was thinking about, so it's taking the learning styles, but applying them to how we write content. So it was thinking about using visual, auditory and kinesthetic words. So, um, I mean, I can take them back, back, back to them as a question, but it wasn't one that, that I particularly can give you much more detail on. I think it's more thinking about the words that we're using in what we're writing um, and applying that to how we create content, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. It's just, um, yeah, because I've previously used the the whole bark with, with the R in it, the reading writing previously in, in a study of mine. So it just... Um, interesting yeah. no that's really interesting yeah it wasn't um it wasn't part of how they've looked at it but I, I can go away and find out why it'd be uh it's a good question for me to ask <laughs> thank you really really interesting excellent thank you 
Thank you very much. Are there uh, any other guests who've got questions for, for Becky? If I could just kindly ask you to unmute and put your questions to Becky. No, that's good. Sarah, currently, uh, if you could unmute Sarah Hawes for, for, from Izzy PR. Um, I, I guess there was a lot in uh, Becky's presentation that you could relate to today. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Becky. It was really, really good. Really nicely presented. Really, really good pace for us all as well. Thank you. Not too much jargon. <laughs> good, good. I tried. <laughs> no, it's really good. I was really pleased that you said talk like a human because, um, you know, lo lots of companies don't. They try and uh, talk very formally when they don't need to. And I'm always bashing on about get your personality out there. You know, I, I always say I always give an accountant as, a, as an example. So sorry, accountants, um, you know, there's nothing worse than reading in a really exciting website about this accountant who's going to do loads for you and then when you meet them they're like this <laughs> um, I always say try and get your personality to match your website and that so um, and people do want to get to know you you know you can use it as a really good tool um, to, to get your words across your how you speak you know I talk with my hands I'm quite lively um, my website is like that if I was more shy it would be written differently so now I was really pleased the Google um, algorithm stuff was interesting as well that was a really um, good explanation thank you Good. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, going back, like people used to feel that they had to be more formal. And I think the world is less formal than it's ever been. And I think with social media, we're really lucky to be able to have that as well as a, as a way of communicating and bringing personality out more. Even if you don't feel you can sometimes add the personality to your website, you've then got that as a channel to use to support it. So it's, uh, it's getting that mix, isn't it? Because people buy people at the end of the day. They do. They do. Yeah. I remember working at Kent Police where they wrote everything like they were filling out an MG5 form or whatever they call it. And they, they talked to you about it. They, they said, what's the story then? You said, well, we apprehended a man. It's like, no, what did you do? Did you grab him? Like, that's what I want to know. Use the right words. Tell me like we're in the pub. And that's so start it up a bit, you know, don't go all the way forward because it's so hard to come back again. <laughs> So true, so very That's true. lovely. Thank, thank you very much, Sarah. Was there anybody else who had uh, a question for our guest speaker today? No, that, that's awesome. Molly, uh, if I may, can I kindly uh, showcase some of our upcoming events, if that would be all right? Thank you. Um, for all of you uh, that, that are uh, virtually networking, uh, if I could give a quick shout out, if I may, for Business Talks with me, Kaz Macklin, that's this Thursday, and that's showcasing the Kentish Soap Company, who are a wonderful little small independent, and they're going to be sharing with us uh, a walk around their business and how they started. I'd also like to, to give a, a quick shout out for our AGM on Friday the 22nd, which is open to, to all of our members. That's going to be a good event. So, you know, do, do put that one in your diary. Thank you very much indeed, Molly. It only remains for me to sincerely thank our guest speaker, uh, Becky, a really quick romp through of the skills and services you have and just to echo Molly's Molly's thoughts we are so lucky to have such amazing businesses in Kent so many members have supported this event and you all do different things I'm all terribly proud of you so thank you all for joining us it only remains for me to say uh, stay safe I hope you and your team stay safe and thank you to Molly and thank you to Becky many thanks for joining us folks <laughs>